The original video work used in this critical analysis production is a copyrighted work. I therefore cite US Copyright Act, Title 17, 512, subsections F and G, specifically those clauses covering comment and criticism, that this is a fair use of copyrighted works for the purposes of commentary and critical analysis. I am additionally citing UK Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988, Chapter 48, Part 1, Copyright, Section 79.4a, for the same purposes under fair dealing. Should any copyright claim be filed under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act against this video analysis, I would be filing counter notices to all parties. Should they decide to pursue this matter legally, then I will have no hesitation in pursuing legal action through the court systems. Censorship is not a valid argument. We are skipping the first segment of the intro. Imagine a silly cartoon-style presentation in the guise of a 50s news report, interspersed with appeals to ridicule, soundbites about historical facts used to misrepresent history and science, as well as misrepresentations of science itself. The rabbit hole and how deep and how far we want to go is really how far, how much do you want to discover about your true nature? Who is Fred Allen Wolf? He is an independent physicist. In other words, he does not deem to subject his own works to peer review. He is the writer of several spiritualist New Age books, including The Yoga of Time Travel, How the Mind Can Defeat Time. He featured in a documentary which followed this film, Spirit Space. As an independent physicist, does not have the relevant scientific background, nor the relevant understanding required to conduct scientific testing and evaluation, or the proper procedures that allow us to examine his work. So, we can safely dismiss his claims on the basis that we can never properly test them in the first place. This is going to be a pervasive theme throughout the movie. Before we've even gotten to any of the real arguments in this production, Mr. Wolf has asserted that the nature of one's journey down a rabbit hole is entirely based on your decision of how far you want to go. Reality is not contingent on any individual's personal opinions or beliefs. This movie has already gotten off to a poor start. So there's two stages to science. Who is Jeffrey Satanova? A psychiatrist for over 20 years. Completed a master's degree as a member of the Theoretical Condensed Matter Physics Group. Until recently, a teaching fellow and a doctoral student in the Department of Physics at Yale University, where he studied the supersymmetric many-body theory as applied to quantum computation. Author of several books that speculate on quantum mechanics as he applies it to conscious thought. As you might have already guessed, does not have scientific qualifications that are valid in the field of quantum mechanics, yet he feels that he has a right to speculate where quantum mechanics applies in the macroscopic physical reality of our universe. There's, there's the crazy part where you go down the rabbit hole, and then there's the, the part where you check the craziness of your ideas against a rigorous, strict, straitjacket-like process. Now we've gone on to an outright misrepresentation of the reality of scientific methodology. While it may be interesting to make statements about science being to do with going down rabbit holes and putting on straitjackets, this is not the reality of the scientific method. Science is entirely about the process of fact-finding, and to do so you have to ignore personal intuition and so-called common sense. That is no excuse to make the statements presented previously. I think the interesting thing about science, um, um, the interesting thing about physics, is that it is a genuinely new and novel way of trying to come to grips with the world. Who is David Albert? He is a physicist, philosopher of physics, and professor at Columbia University. Initially interviewed for the movie under the guise of giving a discussion on quantum mechanics has been vocal in his criticism of the film for taking his discussion out of context and misleading their viewers into believing he supported the proposition given in the movie when he completely disagrees with it. On this basis, any errors attributed to the remarks made by Dr. Albert are not necessarily his own, but may be as a result of deceptive editing practices and quote mining for the statements that he has made. This will become apparent throughout the next series of remarks I will address. Elements of what became physics were drawn primarily from the fields of astronomy, optics and mechanics, which were methodologically united through the study of geometry. These mathematical disciplines began in antiquity with the Babylonians and with Hellenistic writers such as Archimedes and Ptolemy. The disciplines outlined in the linked article are what would eventually be combined into our current understanding of physics today and the modern understanding of physics began in the 17th century. Three to four hundred years is an eternity in terms of scientific inquiry and understanding. There is nothing new about the scientific discipline 
of physics. I think the experimental method, which is important to physics, is a very different business from the method of revelation or the method of meditation. The scientific method is primarily about making discoveries that can be tested and evaluated. Supernatural revelation is based entirely on the concept of faith, belief irrespective of evidence. Meditation, while being a calming and centering experience for many people, is not a method of discovery that can make any observations or predictions about reality. In summary, science is about making discoveries and testing them until accurate conclusions can be drawn, whereas the other disciplines are in no way related to discovering the observational reality of the world. I don't think it's true that, for example, um, adherents of, say, Buddhism um, um, could imagine changing their beliefs based on the outcomes of, of some experiments people do with electrons. Whether Buddhists are convinced or not by the experiments people do with electrons is not a reflection on reality itself. The same is accurate for whether creationists of any religion are convinced or not about the processes of natural selection and genetic drift and how they relate to the vast biodiversity of life on this earth or anywhere else. In the end, it is not about convincing people, it is about making accurate and testable predictions and then applying those predictions to practical applications that benefit everyone. We're skipping the segment about the Bible. To sum it up, it's a discussion of Usher calculating the dates of the supposed creation of the earth according to the genealogies presented in the original biblical texts. I think that there must be a scientific explanation for spirituality. Who is Stuart Hameroff? He's the professor in the departments of anesthesiology and psychology and a director of the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. Has published over 150 peer-reviewed papers, including three co-authored with Roger Penrose. Anne believes that all of his academic achievements gives him the authority to violate the philosophy of science. The scientific method, by the way, is not in a position to comment on the supernatural. Reality does not conform to what individual people think if there is a good scientific explanation for spirituality, then let it be tested in the scientific arena and see if it survives testing. I don't think there's been a good one until, until recently. To me, the only one that makes sense is that proto-consciousness, platonic values, goodness, truth, exist at this fundamental level of space-time geometry, which can influence our actions if we're open to them. Now it appears to be Mr. Hameroff's turn to make a claim that various conceptual ideas are founded in reality if we just open to them. And once again, this is a logical fallacy. Reality does not bend to conscious will and has never been demonstrated otherwise. Claims like this, presented without even a shred of evidence, are dismissed as mere assertions. And it interconnects us to all other beings, to the universe at large. Continued assertions do not count as evidence. However, to paraphrase Carl Sagan, we are made of the elements of the cosmos and in that respect we are definitely connected. This can be evidenced with enough effort on the part of any physicist. That is not a reason, however, to presuppose that we have conscious linkages with everything else in existence and to propose otherwise counts as yet another unfounded assertion. We have only just reached the end of the opening montage and already we have racked up numerous errors for unfounded assertions and misrepresentations of science and scientific disciplines. It gets worse, however. It's time to get wise. Science creates the stories that we live by. Science is not here to tell stories. Stories have narrative structure and are often fictitious in nature, whereas scientific investigation is intended solely to deal with the facts. The only way in which it could be construed differently relates to historical sciences, geology, archaeology, cosmology, etc. The only reason for saying otherwise is to set up an appeal to emotion that follows. And science has told us a very bleak story. What a bunch of pseudo-philosophical nonsense. If you want a discussion on how bleak or hopeful life on Earth is, Take a philosophy seminar, not a science lecture. Science is about reality and is, by its very nature, emotionless, logical and methodical as it must necessarily be. How any one discovery or other makes people feel is irrelevant in scientific discourse. It's told us that we're some sort of genetic mistake, that we have genes that use us basically to move on to the next generation and that we, we randomly mutate. 
misrepresenting scientific fields such as evolutionary biology and naturalistic abiogenesis always gets people on my bad side, especially when the people who put this production together have the research capacity to look up what the actual scientific theories state and therefore should know better. It's rather dishonest on their part. I will expand on the errors shortly. It's said that we are outside of our universe, that we're alone. It doesn't say anything of the bloody kind. It's rather obvious even to the naive observer that we are not apart from each other and that we are very obviously within the universe itself. No reputable scientist would ever make the kinds of statements that this production attributes to them. That we are separate and that we are this sort of lonely mistake on a lonely planet in a lonely universe. First of all, repeating an error does not correct it. To clarify, science has never stipulated that any form of life was a mistake. This rather poorly veiled attack on evolution ignores the primary driving force, which is natural selection, and decidedly non-random. Secondly, we are daily discovering new planets across the starscape. We have so far discovered billions of galaxies, and there are over 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone. Using our technologies to examine nearby stars has revealed that the majority of them have planetary bodies in orbit. So far we have discovered that as much as 23% of Type G2 stars like our Sun potentially harbour Earth-like planets in their systems. The odds of us being alone in the universe on the only planet capable of supporting life are exceedingly remote, to say the least. No scientist would make a claim that we are alone in the universe given what we are currently discovering. However, the assertion that we are alone in the universe and that we exist on the one and only planet capable of supporting life is eerily close to the assertion made within religious texts across the planet. Funny that. It's a little like the claim by creationists that scientists once believed that the Earth sat on the backs of two turtles. Such a ludicrous suggestion is more like a paraphrase of popular culture and urban legend, certainly not of the scientific community. And that informs our view of the world. It informs our view of ourselves. Only if people are convinced by the ideas that this show has thus far presented. The scientific method, while not perfect, has done a lot more for society as a whole than any religious or spiritual claims thus made to date. People have a right to believe anything they wish. They are entitled to their own opinions. They are not, however, entitled to their own facts. Facts belong rightly within the realms of observational reality and are not open to opinion or the emotional acceptance or rejection of individual or group. And we're now realizing that this view, this view of separateness, is one of the most destructive things. It's the thing that creates all the problems in the world. The problems of society are numerous and certainly cannot be attributed to one particular source. However, to make a claim that the problems of our world are down to a cause that hasn't even been validated in observational reality to begin with is without doubt a bizarre and foolish claim. But these people are not idiots. This therefore counts as yet another falsehood. And we're now realising that that paradigm is wrong. Who is Lynn McTaggart? She is the author of the book The Field and What Doctors Don't Tell You. Founder and editor of the publishing house of newsletters and books on alternative health and spirituality, including a newsletter titled What Doctors Don't Tell You, same as the book, speaks on consciousness, what she calls new physics and alternative medicine, poured through, or rather quote mind, scientific papers on quantum physics in order to peddle her pseudoscience, most assuredly does not have the relevant scientific qualifications necessary to properly understand what it is that she is trying to use to explain macroscopic physics. Not that this has stopped her from doing so. You can only realise a paradigm is wrong if you ever accepted such a paradigm in the beginning. The scientific consensus has never proposed such a ridiculous and ludicrous idea to begin with. That we aren't separate. We are all one. We're all together. This by these people is a new revelation, is it? I have to say, if that's the case, then I feel sorry for them. We discovered long ago that working as one society was always going to be more effective than going it alone. Working as a group, pooling specialist skills and abilities always reaps more benefits for everyone than trying to do everything by yourself. This is nothing new. It's been understood as part of modern biology for several decades now. I realise, however, that these people don't mean society cooperation. They mean some form of new age group consciousness, and to that I say this. There is no evidence whatsoever that we can become the naturalistic equivalent of the Borg Collective. Any suggestion to the contrary is both egregious and dishonest. 